Hi everyone, we're getting ready to the, for the keynote address. Can you all take a seat? I think so, yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Yared Halu. Our keynote address this afternoon will be a conversation between Jason Abel, lecturer in law here at Penn Carey Law, and Asosa Osa, Deputy Executive Director of Fair Fight Action. Jason is a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Steptoe and Johnson and chairs the firm's campaign finance and political law practice. He is the former chief counsel of the U.S. Senate Committee on Rules Administration, where he served under then Chairman U.S. Senator Charles Schumer and has extensive experience in voter protection and voting rights including previously serving as the Director of State Voter Protection in Mississippi. Asosa is the Deputy Executive Director of Fair Fight Action, a voting rights organization founded by Stacey Abrams, and most recently served as a Senior Advisor to Abrams' gubernatorial campaign. At Fair Fight Action, she manages the organization's research, communications, political, and organizing teams. She also leads the organization's pro-democracy reform efforts with a focus on policy reform, com combating disinformation, and de-escalation strategy. This follows her work as a campaign manager and chief of staff for a top 2018 U.S. congressional election. Prior to her time in politics, Asosa was a portfolio manager at BlackRock, where she managed a wide array of fixed income products, analyzed monetary and fiscal policy, and led firm-wide research on housing, health care, and inflation. Asosa is a native Ohioan and a graduate of Duke University Sanford School of Public Policy. Please welcome Jason and Asosa. Well, thanks very much, and uh, thanks to TPIC for putting on just a fantastic conference all day today. It was really informative, and just round of applause to all of them. First. So, well, it, it's great to be here with Asosa, um, who just has a wealth of experience in a lot of the topics that we talked about today. So why don't we just dive in? Absolutely. How did you get your start? Right? I mean, you know, you went to Duke, you had experience in financial services, but in campaigns, elections, activism, leadership, it was never really far away from what you were doing. So maybe tell us all how you got into it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it um, started with my, my family. I'm, my, my, I'm a Nigerian. My family, my parents are from Nigeria. So my dad would tell me any, every single night, you can be anything in the world you want to be as long as it's a doctor or engineer. And I think <laughs> that is what led me directly down this path, but in, in uh, all seriousness, I am a, um, a product of progressive policy. Um, I would not be where I am today without um, progressive immigration um, laws, progressive education laws, without um, Head Start, without anti-poverty initiatives. And so I've always been very interested and in, in, uh, majored in public policy when I went to Duke. I uh, also went to school in 2008 where there was a financial crisis and I got very interested. Uh, and so while I was doing a lot of policy work in school, I was um, doing a lot of um, uh, financial work um, during the summers. And so decided to go into finance first, but uh, never lost that passion, never uh, wanted to stop doing that work. And so in, in 2016, uh, I hopped on the uh, presidential for just a few months. And here I am. So you're a native Ohioan. I learned from Cincinnati, not Cleveland. It's a big difference there. Very big difference. Um, so We're not going to talk about football. We, we are in enemy territory. We are in enemy territory. A Bengals and Bears fan here. This is a very risky place to be. But I know, I know. See, she speaks the truth. She speaks the truth. I heard that many a years when I was in school here as a Bears fan, so that is not new. Uh, so that explains a little bit how you went back to Ohio. But working for Representative Harbaugh, campaign manager, chief of staff, how'd you get that position? So um, 
after 2016, uh, where we, we lost the republic in spectacular fashion, um, I was uh, not interested in going back to finance at that point, felt like there was more to do, more I could do, and so uh, decided to do something I never thought I would do after four years in New York City. I was like, it's time to go home. Um, so I went back to uh, to Ohio and was looking for opportunities and, and, and met uh, uh, Ken and Anne-Marie, his wife, and, and he was like, I'm trying to run for Congress. And I'm like, your last name is Harbaugh. He's like, I know. I'm like, this is Ohio. Mm -hmm. He's like, I know. Another football reference here for folks, yeah. And, um, uh, uh, but really uh, uh, hit it off with, with Ken and his family and knew there was so much work to do in this country in all types of communities. Uh, and so I was like, why not go into a super red district in Appalachia, Ohio, and try to get a Harbaugh elected uh, to Congress? And we did really well. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are the types of investments that you need to make continuously year after year after year after year if you're going to have any type of shot of, 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 of making change long term. So you bring up the term investment. And when we were talking yesterday, we talked about investment in you know, certain districts where there are you know, historic levels of disenfranchisement, of neglect from the national perspective. Um, and I think one of those areas that come to mind, and we see that investment, is Georgia. So that's where you are now. You made your way to Georgia. Tell us a little bit about what was happening in 2018 and 2020 at the time that really caused you to make that, that trip down there. Um, so I... Uh, went down to Georgia because I wanted to work for Stacey Abrams. Uh, I followed her for years in college and one day decided to drive down without a job, start knocking doors. Eventually somebody uh, uh, hired me onto the campaign and really got invested and um, surrounded and, and thrown into what all Georgia was, what all Georgia had the potential to be, and what all Georgia had gone through. And, and so many folks think that so much of the political story here starts or ends with 2018, and, and, and it was uh, the investment uh, started well before uh, uh, registering uh, hundreds of thousands of, of uh, black and brown vote, uh, folks to vote, uh, getting a party apparatus in place. The, the investment needed to um, uh, expand voting rights in the state is, is quite significant. The amount of money, the amount of time, the amount of investment, the amount of people that it takes is, is, is quite significant. Uh, and, and so when I got to Georgia, um, and we were we were facing uh, a, a a a race against uh, what you know was called at the time and, and, and today one of the worst voter suppressors in the country. Uh, it was not. Um, there was so much history, recent history that needed to be uh, overcome. We know like this is the state where. In, in 2010, the Quitman 10 plus 2, 10 um, uh, uh, black, the, uh, 10 black women, black activists who decided, had the audacity to run for, for school board uh, in, in Georgia um, and took it over. They uh, were, the Secretary of State, Brian Kemp at the time, took armed investigators to that neighborhood door to door, uh, demanding people prove their registration. They charged those uh, 10, 12 women with 120 felonies uh, of voter registration and fraud. Um, they uh, uh, were, were uh, 
in prison for a, 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 a short period of time, but had to go through four years of investigations and trials, um, had lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods uh, for every single charge to be dismissed. Same thing happened to Olivia uh, Pearson in 2012. The same thing happened to the Asian American Advocacy um, Fund in, uh, in 2014. We knew we had tapes of, 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 the, of our opponents saying, we've got to stop all of these uh, minorities from registering the vote if we want to keep the state. And so uh, that was what I got into before I even stepped foot in Georgia. And you know, soon after, uh, we found out that 53,000 voter registration applications had been placed on hold um, during that cycle, and that 70% of those applications were for Black folks. And um, ran a, a a hard campaign to to change that. Um, did not come out victorious, but came out with a mission uh, and and tried uh, um, to make sure that voting could be expanded in the state of Georgia and started Fair Fight. And I can say that it is one of the very, it is very rare, I think, to have a, um, a job uh, where every day you know that fundamentally uh, the work is good. Uh, but uh, uh, that is what I've been privileged to have and to experience over uh, these last few years and uh, working between 2018 to 2020 to expand voting access across the country to build 17 voter protection um, teams from the ground up, uh, having to make the case that they were important, saying, look, y'all don't have to do anything. We will fund it. We will hire for it. We will put them on the ground. We will make sure that they can be incorporated into the party. Um, we will hand them off to the presidential in 2020, um, but this is important to have. Uh, and, and working at the local, state, and national level to make sure that that work could be done um, was, uh, and, and under Stacey's leadership was, and continues to be the honor and the privilege of a lifetime. So before we talk a little bit more about Fair Fight, um, you're, you're bringing up some really important points, and I think that you know some of the other panels earlier we, we talked about what what can we do, right? I mean, can you talk a little bit about you know specifically sometimes the bumps in the road, right? Because 2020 people look to Georgia and they see, you know, uh, really regardless of partisan, just the victory for voting, right? But it took a lot to get to that point. Right. I mean, there were a lot of mountains to climb there and a lot of maybe sort of, you know, difficult times and setbacks. How do you overcome that? How do you push forward, especially in a state where people might discount? It's Georgia. It'll never, you know, achieve a level of, of voting. Right. It'll never for the partisan folks turn blue. Right. How do you get there? Um, as our, our founder would say, the belt and suspenders approach. Uh, you cannot do one thing, take one tactic, uh, take one path. It, it really is a, um, a combination of so many things. At Fair Fight, we take that to mean uh, litigation, legislation, and grassroots advocacy that we make sure we are doing um, with any um, effort we're undergoing. And so, but there are a lot of um, setbacks. And, and, and one of the things that we don't really have an appreciation of, I think, as, as much as we should in this, in this space, is that sometimes winning looks like losing better. Uh, and sometimes it takes ma many steps, multiple steps, to get where you need to go. But if no one's willing to take that first step, no one's willing to take that second step, um, you, you, you won't be successful. We were not successful when the first time we tried to pitch voter protection teams in, in, in 2020, um, we uh, uh, were, were obviously not um, successful in 2018. I remember uh, being on the voter protection hotlines was one of the most defining experiences of my life in 2018, the number of people 
um, that would call in and say, I don't know if my vote was counted. Um, could you help? Uh, and the number of people that you just couldn't find. Like I, I, the number of people I had to say no to because of the system was so uh, um, poorly designed, poorly run at that time. When someone calls you and says, uh, when the black grandmother in South Georgia calls uh, and says that she took her mortgage, she took her uh, social security card, she took her um, tax statement, she took her uh, voter ID, she took everything um, to vote and was told immediately, no, in the same place she votes every single year that she wasn't um, registered there, was finally able to cast a provisional ballot um, and was wondering if it had been counted. Uh, and you can't find that type, uh, and you can't find her, her her vote in the in the in the system. And to try to understand what someone must have gone through, if those are all the documents they take to vote, like what are if someone is bringing a chair to vote, what must they have experienced before? If someone is bringing seventeen different types of items, like what must they have experienced before? And so, um, no matter how many setbacks uh, you have, whether it's in the legislature, whether it's um, with Board of Elections, what have you, it's always worth going back. It's always worth um, fighting, especially um, when the work is good, as we say, when, and that's why we're called Fair Fight, when you fight, you win. So on to maybe some better years moving on. Uh, so there was an election in 2020. Uh, Georgia was Sort of ground zero for a lot of action, both during the election and as we infamously know, after the election. Um, what was your firsthand impression of some of the voter suppression laws? How, I mean, we're, we were sort of talking about it at the panels earlier, talked about it. How'd you see that really affect turnout in, in the state? And what did you do, what did Fair Fight do to overcome those obstacles? I, uh, I mostly blacked out in 2020 and 2021, so I'm not. <laughs> um, so in uh, 2020, we can cut that into two parts, first half, second half, first half is the primaries. The uh, 2020 uh, Georgia primaries, the I think at one point was called, um, the AJC's headline was a complete and total meltdown. Uh, that's how well they went. Um, and we were, uh, as an organization, uh, prepared for the worst in those primaries because we knew that the system, those, the, 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 it is very difficult to move an entire new election system into place. Uh, and especially if you're not providing training all of the BOE members, the election directors across the state were telling us that they didn't know how any of this was supposed to work. Uh, we were uh, uh, um, making sure people knew that uh, here is what could happen. People aren't gonna be able to find their registrations. People aren't gonna be able to find their voting locations. They're going to be in sane lines um, and we are going to need to have to figure out a way to um, get as many people to, to vote um, as possible. Long lines are, I know we celebrate them as a, um, uh, as, as something that uh, shows how um, the willingness of someone to, to vote, but we should uh, also look at long lines as something that's fundamentally undemocratic. Um, uh, especially when in so many instances, just a few miles down the road, there is no line. Um, and so we saw extremely long lines. We saw people turned away. Um, we saw uh, uh, folks fainting. Um, people um, having access, there's a ton of absentee ballot issues. There are uh, so many different types of issues in the 2020 primaries. And we knew we'd do everything in our power to make sure that didn't happen again. And so um, push for increased training, um, push for 
um, more voting locations uh, pushed at the local level across Georgia for more voting locations. Did a whole host of voter protection activities and uh, did, that's when we started to push back against disinformation as well um, that we uh, had seen starting in 2019 really come into the fold and fray and um, did an extraordinary amount of research as to how disinformation was going to affect our voters. We had never known. We was like, what happens when you put voters into a sea of disinformation? Um, turns out it works. Um, turns out uh, it works on everyone. Um, our voter, or progressive voters, um, and so really trying to figure out uh, how do you push back? How do you inoculate um, folks from disinformation? Um, and uh, uh, did an extraordinary amount of that work all throughout 2020, leading right up uh, in, 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 until the election and dealt with the consequences um, between the general and the runoff as well and after the runoff. So how, how do you combat against the misinformation? And, you know, in a world right now where folks with a straight face talk about alternative facts, right? I mean, when individuals get their opinions and their facts from maybe a particular news channel, how do you break through and combat that? So uh, on the spectrum of information disorder, there's three things. There's misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. Misinformation is something that's not true. No harm intended. Um, somebody accidentally put up the wrong hours to a polling location. Disinformation is, uh, the easiest way to describe it is lies with the intent to lie. Uh, and so someone posting incorrect polling hours on purpose to try to prevent someone from casting a ballot. Malinformation is uh, uh, people using truth to harm folks. It's true information, like say your address. Um, and if you're an elections director and posting that information online. Um, and so we were at that point focused on disinformation and um, making sure that uh, one of the biggest issues we had in 2020 was trying to explain to people that we cannot repeat what they are saying. We, very few people besides large media companies can actually um, push back against dis uh, uh, disinformation because it has to be so consistent. But our big problem was trying, because uh, repeating the lies in, a, in an attempt to, because they sounded so ridiculous, in an attempt to debunk them. Um, but that was only, it was like, don't think about a pink elephant, don't think about a pink elephant, pink elephants are a lie. Uh, and pushing that, that information further and further and further into um, into folks' minds, and uh, uh, we had this focus on like uh, there's a there's a massive need to put out true information, right? Um, but there is also a need to. Uh, it is very difficult to tell someone that a fact they believe is not true. That is a very difficult path to take. Um, it is far uh, a much better path to take is explaining to someone or talking through the motivations behind why someone might be saying that. Uh, and so make it, trying to shift the conversation from um, XYZ is saying the election will be stolen to uh, XYZ thinks that they're gonna lose. Um, that is why they're saying this. How do you prepare someone to know that when they hear that information, um, to know that it's false? Uh, the way that we had to, we, we had to uh, talk with um, all types of, of media companies, of, of, of newspaper, uh, of, of journalists, of folks who wrote stories in certain ways because that is how to write a story. But that process in and of itself was spreading disinformation because uh, it's not helpful if you write all of the lies and then say at the bottom, but it's not true um, because the first exposure someone has, you do not want the first exposure someone has to information to be a lie, right? Because you're, you're, starting, um, you're starting behind. You want the first thing that you say in any article to be, here is the truth. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it's and so um, working with folks to stop um, repeating those lies, to highlight the motivations, to remind folks of our democratic norms, uh, and to um, not uh, uh, play um, by their rules was 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 something that we spent and I spent just an enormous amount of time uh, doing into the 2020 cycle and trying to get folks prepared for what election day and post election day was going to look like if these were the lies being told um, ahead of uh, uh, election day that people are going to try to invalidate ballots, people are going to try um, to, to, to tell people that their vote um, didn't count. And we have seen post 2020 and post 2021 runoffs um, just how bad um, and the, the consequences of this type of disinformation can be. It can be harmful, it can be deadly. Um, and so um, really trying to move through all of that at once in 2020 was, was wild. So is that the biggest obstacle in our election system right now? The, these lies, the disinformation, the big lie that we've all heard about that the election was stolen. I mean, is this the biggest obstacle or what is the biggest obstacle that you've seen in terms of a truly functioning democratic system right now? I know that's a loaded question. We could be here for another three hours with that. But. Right, right, right. Um, I think that, uh, Look, disinformation is a major problem. Um, we are learning that it affects, we know that it affects everyone, not just one type of voter or another. Um, we know that the goal is to decrease trust in institutions and we know what can happen um, to a country when you can uh, effectively decrease trust in institutions. Uh, so that is a major issue. I would say that uh, the uh, uh, erosion of um, laws of, uh, that are supposed to protect voters at the federal level is um, another significant uh, barrier with uh, cases like um, Brnovich and uh, uh, those types making the hurdle to get relief for voters um, so much harder than it has ever been, um, or than it has been in a very, very long time. And so I would say those erosion of rights at both the, the federal level and the um, state level, as well as disinformation, are probably two of the biggest obstacles we're gonna we're gonna face. And making it, um, uh, uh, and I would say if we're gonna round it out with number three, um, preventing people from there's there's three aspects of, of of voting, three main aspects. There is registering to vote, casting your ballot and having your ballot counted. Um, when you make any three of those harder, we, we call it voter suppression. Um, what you've seen in history is a lot of preventing the first, a lot of trying to stop people from registering the vote. Um, what you are seeing in the second, to, to cast the ballot, what you're seeing right now is a lot of the third, um, trying to make it harder for people's votes to count or to count effectively. Um, and so, um, not, and so the moving of voter suppression tactics, the evolution of voter suppression tactics, um, I think is just another thing that we have to, to, to keep in mind um, that may not hurt turnout, but directly impacts the results. That makes a lot of sense. And election subversion is a term that's new to a lot of folks. It's something that's been happening, but something we see post 2020, there being almost a cottage industry of that as well. Um, all right, so a lot of folks are here wanting to know how they can make a difference, how they can get involved looking forward. What advice would you have for them, we've talked about election protection, something we both have done and others oh gosh, in the oh audience, dear. right? So what, what, what can folks do? Um, around elections, please volunteer um, to be um, a voter protection volunteer. That's some of the uh, best times I've had. Me too. <laughs> uh, Most stressful, but you know, best times. But, but, but good times. Uh, know what your board of elections is doing. 
um, go to your board of elections meetings, uh, run for your board of elections. I cannot tell you enough how much the vast majority of the wins we have had on expanding access to the vote have happened on the local level. They control how many voting locations their county can have, um, how many early vote days, uh, the amount of, of grassroots campaign it took to get Cobb County to have Sunday voting, um, which uh, directly impacted uh, 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 Senator Warnock margin of victory uh, was smaller than the number of people that voted in Cobb County on Sunday. Um, and so the, that's, when we cert, that's where we certify election results. I cannot tell you uh, how much of my time I spend on local board of election meetings and how in the massive difference uh, that you can have by just attending, watching, uh, and if you have the time running and becoming involved. So that is the thing that and I, 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 I push for the most. And uh, again, be a voter protection director, be a poll watcher, be a poll worker um, when elections come. There's, it is really fun. I might be a nerd, but it is really fun to like watch a polling location go down. Like that is like people at their best trying to make democracy work on like a fundamental level. And like the little kids are getting a sticker. And like, it's just like, I'm smiling ear to ear. Like I highly, highly recommend uh, that type of work as well. So building off of that too, how do you combat against the cynicism, right? The folks that say, Challenges are too great, right? It's it's too hard. I won't be able to make a difference. What do you say? To, and this is again a loaded question, but what do you say to those folks? Uh, you know, um, realizing that we are sitting here during uh, Black History Month in a time where so many uh, we're taking a step backward in so many ways. Um, we can also, I think, take one of the good things that we can we can take from uh, uh, the fight the fight to to vote, the freedom to vote, the freedom to live, uh, is understanding that. So I, I can't remember who exactly said this quote, but freedom is a hard won thing. Uh, you have to work for it. You have to fight for it. And most importantly, every generation has to win it again. Um, it is not something that uh, uh, is is stagnant. It is always evolving and always needs your work. And I mean, look at this. I, uh, there is no one that has more hope than folks in grassroots work. Um, uh, uh, we elected, uh, a black man and a Jewish man to Senate in the state of Georgia. Uh, I have seen, I have seen uh, little black girls look up and see someone that looks just like them running for the highest office in the state. Uh, if that can't bring you hope, I don't know um, what can. Uh, and so I think as, as, as folks, as black folks, we, uh, there's no alternative but to have hope. So I will always, I, if y'all need somebody to uh, uh, brighten your spirits, feel free to reach out, but uh, uh, hope is dope. Great words to end on. Sosa, thank you very much. Everyone, thank Sosa for coming today. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I think that wraps us up. We've got another fantastic Penn student coming to give concluding remarks. Uh, thank you both for that great conversation. Um, I will now turn it over to Julian Lutz for closing remarks. Oh, we're not, we're not the last person from preventing them from dinner. Oh, there's concluding remarks. <laughs> you are. <laughs> I will be brief. <laughs> 
I'm here to say thank you to a bunch of people here. First of all, as my friend Devante Torriente said earlier today, thank you to everyone who made this possible. Thank you to all of our attendees for coming and listening and lending us your questions and your voices and your ideas. Thank you also to all of our panelists and speakers for lending your expertise in all the areas of your work and your passions. And thank you as well to everyone who has made today possible, especially all of our Toll Public Interest Center family, including Emily, Ayana, Kanisha, Siriana, and everybody else who has put in so much work today. Can we get a quick round of applause? I also want to say thank you to my fellow Toll Scholars for putting in your work and making emails and phone calls and contributing your ideas. And as well, thank you to all the caterers, Penn Law facilities and staff and all the other workers who made today possible. Finally, I do want to say thank you to the late Professor Edward Sparer because today's theme shows that we are continuing his own work today. Throughout his entire life, Professor Sparer built up people. As a worker, he politically organized poor, more, poor mill workers in the South, work that, as we see, continues to this day with new groups and new demographics. Later on, he became a factory worker himself and rose up to become his union's lawyer. And later, he pioneered a system of neighborhood legal services in ways that had never been tried before, bundling community lawyering, direct representation, social work, and finally, impact litigation. And for the last 15 years or so of his life, he pursued that impact litigation to a sometimes unfriendly Supreme Court, winning victories and establishing the rights and roles of people with welfare in our society. As a professor at Penn Law, he founded the Health Law Project and was instrumental in getting a required first-year course in public benefits added to the first-year curriculum, which had gone on changed for years before that. As Penn's own Professor Jim Sandman remembered to me, Professor Sparrow was influential at Penn, and the classes that he shared with students exposed many students who had never even considered public interest work or the rights and the stereotypes that affected poor people and required them to be exposed to that, opening their eyes to the possibilities and the flaws of that system. And so at every step of the journey, Edward Sparer took every opportunity he could to return power to and build power up the poorest Americans wherever he happened to be. He made American democracy and the law better and freer and more humane and more just. And he did it all from the ground up. So thank you all again for coming to the Sparrow Symposium, and please join us in the Levy Conference Center for dinner. Thank you.